You're listening to the main event with Zach Gelb and Mike Zahn on WHIP. Welcome back, everybody. You're listening to WHIP Radio in Philadelphia. 215-204-WHIP is the number. We're getting you ready as it's Cowboys week. The Eagles are in Dallas for some Sunday night football on NBC. And now joining us on the hotline is a former Dallas Cowboys quarterback and is now the color analyst for Cowboys football on Compass Media. And that is the great Danny White. Danny, Zach, and Mike here in Philly. Thanks for a few minutes. And how are you? Hey, I'm good, guys. How are you guys doing? Well, we're doing great, and we appreciate you giving us a few minutes today. So I read something over the weekend, and I guess this has been a case for a little bit of a, of a time period, that Des Bryant has a monkey. What do you know about Des Bryant's pet monkey? <laughs> you know what? I don't know anything about it, uh, and I'm glad I don't. I don't want to know. <laughs> I just thought that was so comical that we're getting ready for Eagles and Cowboys. And uh, Des Bryant's uh, monkey was a topic of conversation on the Internet. But, hey, you find everything on the Internet these days. Um, let's still talk about Des Bryant on the field. Last week against Seattle in a close one, that was a loss for the Cowboys. They haven't won a game since Tony Romo's went down. Des Bryant uh, had two receptions for 12 yards, was targeted seven times. What did you see out of Des Bryant in his return from his foot injury? Well, you know, he looked good coming back. I mean, I, he certainly wasn't uh, back to 100%. He wasn't the Des Bryant uh, that, that we've all come to know and love. But uh, the, the one thing he did accomplish was he took, uh, you know, took the, the best defensive back pretty much out of the game. I mean, I shudder to think how it would have been, how hard it would have been uh, to run the passing game if Des hadn't been there. Uh, you know, I don't, I don't know that the Cowboys would ever have had anybody to throw the ball to, but as it turned out, with him there, at least they uh, they had some success. But that does look good, but certainly not uh, what we expect Des to become. Uh, he'll be better this week. He'll be even better the next week. Um, you know, there's just a certain amount of uncertainty. And as a wide receiver, you know, you you got to have complete confidence in in your legs, and your feet, your you know your body, to be able to do the things you have to do in the NFL. We're talking to former Cowboys player and current color commentator for Compass Media for the Dallas Cowboys. That's Danny White. And Danny, it has been quite a grueling season to have Tony Romo go down, and obviously Dez is back in the lineup. This is a pretty weak NFC East division. Do the Cowboys still stand a chance in this division? Well, that, that's the saving grace. Uh, you know, it, uh, when I when I talk to people now at two and five, and they say, "Is, is there any chance?" And, and I say, "Well, you know, it's true. The Cowboys need a miracle." But uh, you know, to pay, paraphrase a great movie line, uh, "You ask for a miracle, I give you the NFC East," uh, <laughs> and, and and that is the the one thing. That all the teams in the NFC East still have a shot, and and uh, but it's only because the the division is struggling and uh right now it seems like the eagles are playing the best football of all those teams giants are starting to play pretty well but you know it's going to boil down to the second half of the season in the nfc east and who can kind of get it going now you personally played with the cowboys until 1988 then jerry jones bought the team in 1989 just a couple years later he started a dynasty how did the culture change once jerry jones became the owner of the dallas cowboys well, the, you know, the culture in the locker room changed as, as, in terms of, uh, you know, going after the best athlete. Uh, Jerry has always set aside uh, off-the-field issues. He's probably uh, probably as lenient an owner as there is in the league when it comes to signing guys like a Greg Hardy, uh, you know, like a Henry Melton last year, and guys who had had, had issues in other places, and he seems to always want to give them a second chance or a third chance. And he's been, um, he, he's, he's done pretty well at that. I mean, I don't, I don't, I think this year, you know, with Joe Randall, and Greg Hardy is, has been a real force on the field. Um, but that's the way the culture has changed. I mean, you know, and it, and it affects the chemistry in the locker room. I don't know if he fully understands that like Tom Landry did. You know, Tom Landry was a guy that created an environment where people could exceed their own own potential just by plugging into the system, buying into the system, and, and everybody was on the same page. It was it was built on work, work, hard work, hard preparation. Uh, you know, playing 60 minutes. It was it was all the intangibles that were so important. We were not the biggest, strongest, fastest team in the NFL by 
any stretch. But now Jerry is really looking for the best athlete he can get, the you know the the best football player he can get, um, even at the expense of some of those off the field issues. So he had that whole snafu on the sideline in Greg Hardy against the Giants. Uh, I think it was two weeks ago. Yeah. Um, so, so you weren't surprised that when Jerry Jones went out there and signed Greg Hardy because I thought it came at an interesting time. And I don't think Greg Hardy is a good dude by any measure, but I thought it was an interesting time, uh, especially the direction the league was moving in with the awareness of domestic violence with all they suffered last year. So you weren't surprised when, when they signed Greg Hardy. No, you know, first of all, Jerry Jones doesn't really care that much about the league. He cares about the Dallas Cowboys and and what's going to make them a better football team, what's going to get the Cowboys to the Super Bowl. And at the time, you know, we're looking for pass rush, and especially from the defensive linemen. And and uh, so that, I think, is what precipitated the, the signing of Greg Hardy. I, I wasn't surprised. I, I, I got to tell you, with my personal feelings, uh, being a, a team guy and a locker room guy and a chemistry guy, uh, I was disappointed. But but I wasn't I was just I really wasn't surprised. I mean he's done it over and over again. And if you've got strong enough leadership in the locker room, and you saw Des Bryant kind of get involved in that, and he's the he's the vocal leader. And that's one of the things I love about Des Bryant is, you know, he, he wears his emotions on his sleeve. Whereas Tony Romo, Jason Witten, Sean Lee, some of the other leaders are quiet leaders, and and uh, they they need that from Dez, and they need that from more people, I think, but Dez has always been a positive force for the team. He, he never he never turns it against his own teammates, uh, whereas Greg Hardy, I think, crossed that line a little bit last week, and, and that's the kind of thing that needs to be addressed and corrected. Greg Hardy is ultimately in in the lineup. He's going to continue to play. Joseph Randall, on the other hand, is released. Not sure if that's play-related or if that's because of an ongoing investigation. What are you hearing? I, I, you know what, I'm not, I'm not in the locker room, and if there's one thing I know is it's, it's easy to speculate for those of us on the outside, and, you know, I, I talk to Jason Garrett on a regular basis and, and some of the players, but, uh, you know, that, that's something that's behind closed doors as far as I'm concerned, and, and I really wouldn't comment on it if I could, but I really can't. I don't know anything except I do know that Joe Randall has had issues in the past, uh, the, the, there are some things about him and, and the, the, the description that most of the coaches and the people that I've talked to on the inside have given me of Joe Randall is that the guy needs to grow up. He, he needs some maturity. He's a great athlete, a great football player, but he just never has grown up. And, and uh, so for what, for what that, whatever that means, uh, that, <laughs> that, that's the, the answer that I've been given. Danny White joins us on the hotline right now, WHIP Radio in Philadelphia. Let's take you back to the Cowboys running back last year was DeMarco Murray. He led the league in rushing. In the offseason, the Cowboys didn't re-sign him. He goes over to Philadelphia and signs with them. And, and to be honest, I, I want to say DeMarco Murray, with all the hype that was built up around him, has been a, de- a disappointment here in Philadelphia through his first seven games. And it's really not his fault. I just don't think Chip Kelly utilizes him to the best of his abilities in Chip's system. And he's had two good games the last two weeks. Uh, I know he had some good yards against the Giants, but it came up in garbage time. You've been around DeMarco Murray. Do you at all think he regrets uh, leaving Dallas to come to Philadelphia? Well, no. I, I think there are several million reasons why he doesn't regret it, too. Uh, you know, and, and uh, unfortunately or fortunately, however you want to look at it, it's a business. And, and DeMarco had it treated as a business, and nobody blames him. You know, everybody in the Cowboy organization, to a man, everybody I've talked to loves DeMarco Murray. He was a team guy. He, you know, he worked well in that system. He, he fit in perfectly. And now he's a little bit of a, of a square peg in a round hole in that system, and he's just not getting the numbers. He's not having the results on the field that, uh, that he had in Dallas. In Dallas, he was a perfect fit. DeMarco's not a Marshawn Lynch. He, he's not a Frank Gore. He's not a Adrian Peterson in terms of in terms of um, making yardage on his own, just running through people, running over people. Uh, he, he was perfect for the Dallas system with those big offensive linemen, and and he all all he needed was a little bit of a crease, and he could turn it into a big play. He was that kind of a guy, and still is. You know, he's just not in the right kind of system, or the system hasn't evolved 
to fit the talents that he has. You know, one way or another, for him to put up the same kind of numbers he did in Dallas, uh, one of those two things, either he's got to adapt to their system or they've got to adapt to his. And, and um, uh, you know, who knows? I mean, tell. I'll preface my next statement with uh, this. Um, the Seagulls offense hasn't been very good this year. I don't like Chip's play calling. Uh, Sam Bradford has not been a very good quarterback. The offensive line is all banged up. And uh, who knows if Jason Peters is going to play this week. But with all that being said, I've been very impressed with this defense this year. The Seagulls defense always forces turnovers. And I just don't think the Cowboys have it this week to win uh, up against the Eagles because I don't see them putting up more than 17 points up against this Eagles defense. You're around this Cowboys team a lot calling the games. What do the Cowboys have to do to win this week? Because I just don't see a scenario where the Cowboys win. Well, you, you just said it. They, they need to not turn the ball over. I mean, the Philadelphia Eagles are, are the most prolific team in the league at creating turnovers, and uh, they, they do a great job of it. There's no question about it. And the Cowboys have gotten have gotten one turnover in the last three weeks. Uh, so that's going to be the big discrepancy. That's the thing that's going to change about the Cowboys. They've got to get them on defense and they've got to protect the ball on offense. And that's the only way that the Cowboys are going to beat the Eagles. We're talking to Danny Wade. And Danny, while we have you here, a few more with you. You got to play under the legendary coach and Tom Landry. Can you give me your best Tom Landry story? Oh, boy. Well, Tom Landry stories are hard to come by. Let me tell you, he wasn't, he wasn't the most flamboyant guy in the world. <laughs> uh, uh, so, there, you know, he... You, you, what you saw was what you got with Tom Landry. I mean, very stoic, hard worker, back you know behind closed doors in his office studying film all the time. Um, you know, the the only you know in 13 years I never heard him raise his voice, which which is pretty incredible for an NFL coach. And uh, the first time that uh, you know that I had a kind of a, or was afraid of him, I guess, was my rookie year when I faked a punt and called a pass play in the huddle at the end of a game against the Steelers. It was frustrating. We hadn't done anything on offense. I was trying to make something happen. And, you know, I was punting. I was backing up Roger Staubach at the time and, and just punting. And so I was frustrated anyway. And in the fourth quarter, I got in the huddle on my own, called a fake punt, and it, you know, it didn't work. And, and, uh, and so I ran over the sideline. I got on the, on the bench and put a big coat over my head, hoping he wouldn't see me. And, a few minutes later, I see these two dress shoes walk up, and I'm looking down at the ground, and all I see are these two t- dress shoes. <laughs> and I never saw one guy in the stadium wearing dress shoes. And, I, and so I looked up, and it was Coach Landry. He looked down at me, and he just gave me that that look, you know, where it goes right through you, and he just said, you just can't do it. You just can't do it. And that's all he did, turned around and walked up. Man, I mean, it was like someone – stuck a hundred daggers in me and and uh uh but that was yeah that was tom landry you know he never got really out of control he, he never lost his temper uh, uh just a very very professional man but if you messed up you know you knew it just by the look he gave you and you you were both a quarterback and a punter and i think the last quarterback I see to punt to football was actually Tom Brady in a divisional round game up against the Broncos in the playoffs a few years ago. Now they protect the quarterback so much, and I don't see a team putting a quarterback out there consistently to punt ever again. Do you ever see a scenario where that could be possible, where you see a quarterback punting a few times in a game? Well, the game has become so specialized. You know, I, I, I can't see that unless it was is like Tom as a backup. Um, uh, you know, usually the kicker is the backup punter, and the punter's the backup kicker. And uh, so, you know, I I think those days are probably behind us. But it wasn't a big deal back then. It was just something I had done all my life. In fact, I was also a kicker. And uh, you know, in high school and college, I I placed kicked as well. So uh, just to play quarterback and punt was actually less than I was used to doing. And and uh, it was just something I had done all my life. But, yeah, today, kids from the time that they're, they start in Pop Warner or Pee Wee football, they're pretty much specialized. They, they're they taught to do one thing 
and uh, they get as good as they can at that. That's just the world we live in. It's always interesting to hear those kind of stories because I think it was uh, Jerry Kramer on those Packer teams that was an offensive lineman, and then he also kicked field goals. So it's always interesting to see when people do those two roles. Uh, last one with you before we uh, let you run as we're talking to Danny White. You were the successor to Roger Staubach, like you said. Uh, take me back to that time where you're the starter replacing Roger Staubach. And how much pressure was on you, and did you feel that pressure? Well, I guess there was a lot of pressure on me, but I didn't feel it. You know, I'd been in the system for four years. I knew the system. I knew the team. I knew the players. I inherited a Super Bowl team from two years earlier. Uh, you know, great offensive line, uh, great defensive line. Uh, you know, that was Doomsday, and that was that was Tony Dorsett, and it was Drew Pearson. And, you know, so I had a great bunch of guys around me. Um, and so I, if there was pressure, and I, I'm sure there was, everybody tells me there was, to try to replace Roger, but that's not what I was doing. I, I was just out there doing what I did best, and I thought there were things that I, I could do that were probably better than Roger. I was a timing thrower. I, you know, I got the ball out early, and, and, and Roger was a scorer, and he was, he was always waiting for guys to get open. And, and uh, so, But, you know, there certainly were a lot of things that Roger did well, which – you know, led to some Super Bowls and some Super Bowl victories. Um, but the pressure really came uh, through the media because they were constantly asking me about it. You know, do you feel the pressure? You, you know, and, I, and I said, you know what, the only time I feel it is when you guys ask me questions about it. And, and uh, uh, so it was a kind of a strange environment to play in. But, you know, it was such a great team and such a great system. Tom Landry had created – a system where uh, people could actually exceed their own potential. Uh, because if you plugged into the system and you were part of the team and you bought into it, you know, you could do things that you never, never could have done otherwise anywhere else. And, and uh, so, yeah, I, you know, to answer your question, I'm sure there was a lot of pressure on me, but it wasn't something that I felt. It wasn't something I thought about a lot. I just went out and played and tried to use the people around me uh, and and not try to do it all myself. Well, Danny, this was a whole lot of fun. We appreciate a few minutes today. We also hope that you enjoyed your hunting trip uh, a few weeks ago, so we appreciate you giving us a few <laughs> minutes today. I did. Thank you very much, guys.